Good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, here I will be presenting uh, some of the lab ventricle hernias and how to deal with uh, the common complications. I have deliberately excluded some of the complications, which may be very rare, and hence I have added more and more of the videos. As we all know, any complications could be intraoperative, early postoperative, and late postoperative. I will be concentrating more on intraoperative and early postoperative situations here. This is the axis injury, as you know. The stomach is distended here. And all these patients, as you are aware, have got in, uh, problems. And you see, this is, there was an injury with the trocar because of the stomach, which was not deflated before. And as you can see there, there's a puncture. What is very important is to recognize this. And once you have recognized this, surely the problem remains simpler. I think there's something wrong with the videos. This is a small intestine injury produced by the varus needle. You will see that here. You will find two punctures here, one and one on the other side. So these are the two injuries as we are aware that all these patients, most of them, they are the incisional hernias and the bowel is adherent. Whatever method you may use for access, it would be open method or a varus needle. There is a very definite possibility of getting into the bowel or the stomach in some unusual situations. I have collected these videos from some of my friends who had this problem. And you see here, this again is the injury to the bowel. I think there's little mix up in this. Yeah. This is a urinary bladder injury. You know, in the, some of the reoperative cases, the bladder may be adherent to the lower scar, especially the scars produced after cesareans and hysterectomies. And there may be a disorientation and then there may be injury to these urinary bladders. See this? It's a thinned out bladder and there is injury. One can see inside the bladder. Obviously, the right thing to do is to repair, maybe put in a, a catheter and the drain as well. And it depending on the surgeon's opinion about this, one can go ahead and operate or one can do it in a different city. So th these are some access injuries and also the dissection injuries which are there. Another is the port bleeds and the injuries to the epigastric. You see, you can see the inferior epigastric artery but still the surgeon continues an attempt to go there and is not able to really move on from there and actually punctures the inferior epigastric. Well, as we said that, you know, those things are possible. It's better to show it here so that we know that these are the injuries which are possible and also can be prevented. Now, Two other places from where the bleeding can come probably is the omentum and mesentery. What is important is to recognize these two injuries and bleedings and to correct them, which is not a difficult matter. Gut injuries, again, because of the adhesions, the injuries to small bowel is fairly common, especially the patients who had dense adhesions and the postoperative sepsis. The bowel may be very densely adherent to the anterior abdominal wall and to the scar, and 
There may be a small entrotomy, which can be repaired. And we have a policy that once we have an entrotomy, we defer the surgery and do not do any mesh placement. But what we do is we try to separate as many adhesions as possible and then leave the patients alone. Maybe after about three weeks, we go in again when the adhesions are very flimsy and then by the time the bacteremia and other features, intra-abdominal features are subtle, and then you can go in and put in a mesh. Now this is a patient who had a, a T incision for roadside trauma, and on that side, there are, on the left side, we had possibility of liver, spleen, diaphragm, and urinary bladder injuries. This is a rent which is going into the diaphragm, which needs to be repaired. And one can go ahead with the procedures. Sometimes uh, it is possible to convert and in an abdomen, battlefield abdomen like this, where a lot of infections have taken place. If you see here, there was a colostomy on that side, multiple incisions. It is quite possible that either by closed technique or by open technique, one may not be possibly get entry into the abdomen. And these are the cases which needs to uh, uh, be converted into conventional surgery. In this patient, you will find the abdomen, the lot of bowel is gone. It's very densely adherent. A gentle dissection without using any cautery should be the, the preferred method of separating these adhesions. But sometimes you may find the adhesions are too many and it may not be possible to separate them, which demands a conversion or a limited conversion. The other situation is that the bowel may be going inside the hernial sac here. And you see that there are a lot of momentum and also the bowel which is there, which is very densely adherent to the thinned out skin of the hernia and it may not be feasible and possible. And in this situation, the best way to handle this is to make a small skin incision on the top of the thinned out skin. Separate these adhesions under vision. We very strongly believe in a laparoscopic repair. So what we do is we separate those adhesions, close the peritoneum, as you do in a conventional surgery. But instead of repairing from interior side, we prefer to close the skin incision and still go back in and put a large mesh so as to have a, a more than five centimeter overlap all around, which is the the best way to prevent recurrence. As you see more and more videos of entrotomies, as you know that entrotomy is one of the commonest complications, especially with the bad incisional hernias, which had a sepsis in the post-operative period. And our policy has been, once there is an entrotomy, it's better to avoid the primary repair at the time and putting in a mesh is always better to repair the bowel, let the patient come out of the whole episode, and three to six weeks later, one can deal with this. You can see that here. I know, I think, you know, looking at here, sometimes you find that how could anybody do that, but I can assure you all surgeons who are here, they, they will agree that these are the things which you see. Some of the Mesh-related complications, which we see, one very common, uh, uh, which has come and referred to us for some or the other reason, is the mesh infection. And as you know, there is one point, and that is the removal of the mesh, and without any the same. And also, it is possible to do a laparoscopic repair in many of the recurrences of a laparoscopic surgery. Yes, you will see that. Yeah. 
The patient had a laparoscopic surgery and a repair. And the patient had a recurrence. We decided to go in again. You can see the mesh there. And the commonest cause is a, a small mesh. In laparoscopic surgery, I think it's always advisable. You see the mesh here, which got folded into the area and got sucked into the hole. And this is because of the small mesh. We always advocate that we have to use as large mesh as possible to have a very clear cut overlap of about five centimeter all around because we all know that various types of mesh, depending on the situations, might contract almost up to 40%. So a 10 centimeter mesh becomes a six centimeter mesh and then leaves a space from where the recurrence can take place. Commonest though innocuous problems are the seroma and the best way to handle the seroma, this is a small, just to demonstrate, a small compression bandage on this side and these are the three parts. And these bandages and the compression is kept for about 10 days to two weeks, and which, is, which prevents almost 40% less uh, seroma formation. However, of late, we have started using a spraying the fibrin sealant into the sac and producing a compression, which causes additions, and we have seen, again, the further reduction of volume of the seroma by about 40% as seen on the ultrasound. Chronic pain, I think uh, many of us have witnessed chronic pain, and most of these chronic pains are because of the stapling devices and the uh, sutures, fixation sutures, or with the uh, multiple uses of the various processes for fixation, and that should be avoided to minimum. Of course, a local anesthesia or a nerve block is the answer to that. Some of these meshes, because of the adhesions, even the higher generation meshes and the better so-called layered meshes can produce bowel adhesions and cause intestinal obstruction. You can see a three-layered mesh there, which is supposed that the intestines may not be adhering to it, but still you can see the adhesions, and this causes a kinking and a small bowel obstruction. So in a case of a ventral hernia, once the patient presents with a, a recurrent bouts of vomiting and abdominal distension, this is a distinct possibility. And after investigation, one should make it a point to go in and look at that. However, I think the worst thing, which we should never happen after incisional hernia repair, is the hernia re recurring from the port side. So this is something which is not acceptable. And that is something which one should try to avoid because not taking away one hernia and giving another hernia on the other side, which used to be normal, is fairly an accepted surgical practice. So it is better to close all the 10 mm ports and mostly the ports which are below umbilical level and prevent such hernias which can very clearly be prevented. These are certain reference from which we have taken. So I will conclude that incisional hernias and ventral hernias and abdominal wall hernias sometimes could be very challenging uh, uh, for the surgeons. And uh, an important uh, uh, fact remains the adhesiolysis and separation of the bowel from the hernial site without causing entrotomy. In case of doubt, it is better to put in a suture there. And in case of entrotomies, we prefer to avoid placement of the mesh for the prevention of future complications and prefer to go in after about three weeks and put in a mesh uh, uneventfully. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay.